Welcome to the third and final panel. I've been just incredibly pleased and delighted with um, what we've heard so far, and I'm really glad we're videotaping it. Um, and I hope you can stay for the, the cocktail part of our cocktail party uh, following this panel. And thank you to the last panel in particular, spellbinding speakers. Um, Okay, I would like to ask each of you to introduce yourselves and your department before you go, and I will give you uh, a two minute and one minute uh, indication somehow. Do you wanna, oh wait, yes, you're beginning. Sure, um, hi, my name is Nassim Zakavadi. I am an associate professor um, of both pediatrics and neurology. Um, I'm a pediatric neurologist at the hospital, and uh, I'm just excited to be here to talk a little bit about some uh, issues that are near and dear to my heart. Are we going through and doing introductions, or are we just we? starting? Actually, let's, let's, let's oh. do all, I, I would love to hear from all of you right now. Sure, um, my name is April Sizemore Barber, and I am a uh, assistant professor of the practice in a women's and gender studies program maybe soon department, we, who knows, <laughs> but I'm um, really excited about some of that that's happening. Uh, hi, I'm Jenny Klugman. I'm the managing director at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security and a fellow at the Women in Public Policy Program at the Kennedy School. Great, thank you. Nassim, go ahead. All right, it's great. I've got just a few slides. I'm gonna see if I can go ahead and advance. Perfect, and there is our first slide. So, um, you know, this is a, a topic that sort of I became interested in um, about two years ago and started sort of taking a little bit closer look about into um, compensation um, uh, for female women physicians um, and noted a very interesting uh, disparity and sort of started to investigate a little bit further why that disparity exists. Um, and uh, that is, I think, gonna be a great topic, topic of discussion for us today. So last year um, in JAMA, there was an interesting article uh, titled Sex Differences in Physician Salary in US Medical Schools. It was published in September of 2016. And essentially, the conclusion of the study was that uh, physicians with faculty appointments um, at approximately 25 US public medical schools, so this was data that was publicly available, um, were, it was noted that there were significant differences in salary, even when we adjusted, they adjusted for age, for experience slash seniority, um, specialty, so what, you know, this medical specialty, uh, the faculty rank, assistant, associate, professor, uh, chair, um, taking research productivity into account and clinical revenue, so how much um, a physician was generating. Um, even when taking all of those factors into consideration, there was a significant pay gap between men and women. Um, interestingly, the largest gaps existed in certain fields, um, which included hematology, oncology, neurology, which is my uh, field, cardiology, obstetrics, orthopedics and surgery. So that sort of um, you know, led me to look a little bit further at data that I had access to to see if I could sort of tease apart why it was that, that there was this gap um, and to try to understand it a little bit better. Uh, as a member of the American Academy of Neurology, I had access to a survey. Um, a compensation and productivity survey that um, essentially provides benchmarks of compensation and um, a productivity for neurologists in the United States. And so the survey was open for approximately six weeks um, and member, <laughs> excuse me, members of this professional organization, about 15,000 members were invited to participate. Um, out of those, about 1,400 completed the survey. The nice thing about completing the survey is that you would then have access to the results. So you could say, okay, I um, completed the survey, which you know was kind of, a, it's, it's a little bit on the longer side and it's very technical. Um, and I think that kind of scares people away, but um, the nice thing about completing it is you, then you can look at the data and then you can see how you yourself compare to benchmarks in the US. 
So the most recent data was uh, just published um, in mid-July, so relatively new information. And um, just to give you sort of a, uh, an idea of the gender distribution of neurologists um, that are part of <laughs> the AAN, <laughs> excuse me, in the United States, um, we're looking at a, a, <laughs> a significant split about 60, I'm sorry, it's not easy to visualize, but 65% male and about 34% female. So this is a field that is uh, uh, more uh, males, I would say, than females, whereas there are other fields that are a little bit more equally split, but certain, certainly neurology is one that is heavily skewed towards males. Um, this is sort of a breakdown of, and this is, is not a slide, I'm just gonna go past it because it's, uh, it's not easy to see the various specialties that the individuals who completed the survey uh, were in. And then I looked specifically at the pay gap by the setting, academic setting or private practice setting, and then um, looking at gender specifically. And so what I found was that in academic medicine, um, there was a pay gap of about $28,000, um, uh, meaning that men uh, had a salary that was roughly $28,000 greater than women. Uh, when I looked at hospital-based practices, I found that the gap widened to over $49,000. Uh, Multi-specialty practices, um, so this is a group maybe of various specialties that, um, like a private practice group, um, $42,000 gap, and then a neurology group either existing in a hospital or outside of a hospital uh, was the largest gap at about $51,000. So then I looked at um, RVUs, which, was, which is a term, uh, relative value unit. So this is a term that is used to sort of uh, measure a physician's productivity. So if you are a surgical, in a surgical specialty, uh, traditionally you generate higher RVUs. If you do a procedure, you generate more RVUs. If you're a primary care physician and you're doing a well child check, or a primary care uh, visit, you actually generate fewer RVUs. RVUs in most institutions are tied to your salary and your compensation. So I looked at that to see, well, how much are physicians, these physicians generating, and is that somehow tied to the pay gap? And so in an academic setting, what I noticed, <coughs> excuse me, was that the RVUs were a little bit lower for, for women, 2957 versus 3200 for men. Um, and again, that pay gap was about 28,000. So we're like, okay, well maybe that explains the disparity. But then when I looked at the hospital-based neurologists, they actually, the women were generating more RVUs. Um, yet there was a significant discrepancy in their compensation and they were actually being paid less. So you can sort of make the argument, well, they're actually generating more revenue for the hospital, but the hospital is actually paying them less than their male counterparts. Um, Multi-specialty practice, um, the RVUs, you know, 4,600 versus 5,100, you know, that, to me, that's not a huge difference in RVUs to explain a $42,000 gap in uh, compensation. Um, and then the neurology group, um, significantly, I would say the men were producing more RVUs, and I think that that was reflected in the pay gap as well. So then I looked at specialty to see if maybe there were certain specialties where um, within the field of neurology where um, perhaps uh, there, there was a trend to explain, <laughs> to explain this. And it was hard to make, uh, you know, it was hard to know. I mean, there were certain specialties, behavioral neurology, where the gap was a little bit narrower. Um, I think that um, the highest gap was in neuromuscular uh, medicine and the reasons for that are, are not entirely clear. Um, I don't have a great explanation for why the gap tends to be larger for certain specialists than it does for others. Ah, so I ended a little bit early. Um, I'll give you my sort of um, thoughts on this. Um, you know, this survey doesn't ask all of the questions that I would want to ask, and I've actually been working with the survey administrators to try to insert more questions into next year's survey so I can better understand the association, better understand why it is that certain 
uh, in certain fields such as neurology, women um, are being paid less even though they're generating um, at, in certain fields, um, in certain settings, equal RVUs. Um, you know, I think that in medicine, um, I think that maternity leave is a significant factor. I think that oftentimes women, myself included, um, you know, will will have a baby and will take three, you know, three, four, you know, three months is actually generous. So three months off to spend with your your newborn child, and then you'll come back to work and uh, you will have lost three months of productivity. And over time, you would think that that three months is sort of, yeah, you know, you'll make up for it over time. But honestly, it uh, it becomes difficult to achieve parity um, because your productivity has gone down. So when we looked at those RVU numbers, those revenue value units, um, relative value units, um, those RVUs for the year are going to be lower. And that means that you were less productive that year, which means that your compensation, which is tied to your RVUs, is probably going to be lower. So if it's lower that year, then it affects you the following year, perhaps even the following year. And then let's say you have a second child and then it kind of, again, um, you're affected by it. And so I've noticed that, I have certainly noticed that, and I've had meetings with administrators in our department, um, and that is always one thing that I sort of try to bring to the forefront, that you know there are certain reasons for this. And so I think that we have a long ways to go in sort of um, making the work environment um, family friendly. Uh, I think that the way we measure productivity and the way we, um, measure value um, is something that needs to be thought about um, and some things that maybe we could do to be a little bit more cognizant of these things. Um, because when you think about it, when someone's salary is lower, they're putting less into their retirement. And so it actually affects them at multiple levels. And then when they go for a contract renewal in a few years, it becomes that much more difficult to re renegotiate everything is sequentially affected. Um, and I, I think that one of those significant um, factors is, uh, it, it is maternity leave. And, and I, I'd love to hear if anybody else has had similar experiences in, in other fields outside of medicine, because I think that in medicine, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty big factor for us. Thank you, perfect 10 minutes. On the dot. <laughs> Okay, um, so first I just want to thank you all, the Gender Justice Initiative, for giving us this real gift of an unusually interdisciplinary discussion on gender, because I think we get stuck in our, our little um, disciplines and also our schools. Um, so today I'm going to present a piece from my book project, Prismatic Performances, Queer South Africa and the Fragmentation of the Rainbow Nation. Um, and in this larger project, I look at how representations of South Africa's gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender populations uh, reveal the um, race and gendered contradictions within the post-apartheid state. So since 1996, uh, LGBT South Africans have benefited from de jure equality in what is one of the world's most progressive constitutions. Um, where sexual, sexual orientation is protected in the Bill of Rights and gay marriage has been legal there since 2006. So um, much, much earlier than many places in the world. Yet the majority of the population remains subject to de facto mar marginalization because South Africa is deeply, still deeply stratified across racial and economic lines. It has the world's highest Gini coefficient marking the gap between its richest and poorest. And so moments when LGBT people, and I'll be using the term queer as a kind of shorthand, the moments where they become visible in the public sphere often serve as what I term a prismatic function in that they draw attention to these racial and gender inequalities and gaps and disrupt this, especially the dominant post-apartheid narrative of rainbow nation, which works doubly for the, of course, LGBT rainbow, rainbow. Everybody's a rainbow. Um, and so in the larger project, I look at a variety of case studies. Um, I look at drag performance, photography, soap opera, online fandom, lots of different sites. Um, but today, I wanna, I'm going to be talking about the everyday tactical performances of members of The Chosen Few, which is a soccer team uh, comprised of black lesbians from Johannesburg area townships and informal settlements. 
So where black queer identity is popularly often framed as un-African un and black lesbians are frequently targets of sexual assault, these women in their everyday embodiments remix popular and often homophobic perceptions of what African culture is. I first met members of The Chosen Few at an early morning protest in October 2010. The night before, 12 lesbians had been arrested at a house party in the township of Los Loris. And local police had intruded and maced all the guests while shouting homophobic slurs and stating categorically that there were no lesbians in Los Loris. And when I arrived at the police station, a group of local lesbians were loudly countering the officers' assertions. They were dancing in a circle, clapping, singing in unison. And one of those leading the chant, a powerfully built woman with multiple piercings and a bleached frohawk fade, introduced herself to me as Maniga. She mentioned she was at the protest representing the Black Lesbian NGO Forum for Empowerment of Women, or FEW, and the Chosen FEW soccer team. It might seem odd that soccer players would double as political activists, but as visible out lesbians within their communities, they were already in the spotlight. The team was founded in 2003 as part of an outreach initiative by FEW with the goal of educating a generation of young black lesbians on their rights and empowering them through sport. Yet activism seemed to be the primary focus. During the most intensive period of my research in 2010 and 2011, I was only aware of them actually participating in two soccer matches. Um, <laughs> And in conversations, the players expressed an acute understanding of their unusually public position as lesbians in their township communities. And similarly, their participation in events such as the gay games uh, situated them as the face of South Africa to a larger LGBT world. And in the run-up to the 2010 World Cup, BBC, ESPN, New York Times, and The Guardian each produced a human interest story around the team framing their struggles as metaphors for South Africa as a larger post-colonial state and still developing nation. Early in my research, Maniga, the player I was closest to and uh, who, due to time limitations, uh, will be my primary focus today, told me, we live in a patriarchal society. We're fighting for equality, but at the end of the day, we are oppressed by ikolcha. Indeed, ikolcha, which is a Zuluized slang for culture, is the nebulous ground on which queer Africanness continues to be negotiated. While the Constitution states that South Africa belongs to all those who live in it, for many black communities, African culture is largely understood both implicitly and explicitly to be heterosexual. And by contrast, homosexuality is seen as a white thing. Um, and white people are not seen as African in the same way. So by inhabiting an identity that is understood to be culturally impossible, and seen by some in their communities as needing violent correction, the players had to be strategic in how they negotiated their surroundings. And they did this through what I call, um, what I term a double move of projection and protection. So just by being out, they were subjunctively acting as if. Their openness projecting a world where their constitutional rights would be respected and recognized by their communities. Simultaneously, they also pragmatically adopted exaggerated personas to protect themselves against the reality that this was, in fact, not yet the case. Um, and by utilizing this subjunctive framework, acting as if their rights would be recognized, they were able to latch on to what queer theorist Jose Munoz has termed queers, quote, insistent on the potentiality or concrete possibility of another world. Uh, Yet, unlike Munoz's queer utopia, everyday performances in hostile environments are of necessity pragmatic and self-protective. Manika's self-confidence and charm could be overwhelming. When interviewed about Few's activist work, she spoke in jargon, using words like patriarchy, feminism, capitalism, to describe her position in the world. Off the record, she used more colloquial language, soliloquizing about her girlfriends and previous conquests. Like many who came of age in post-apartheid, post the chosen few players embraced what South African scholar Sarah Nuttall terms cultural accessorization, the trying on identities and picking and choosing their affiliations from local and global repertoires. Most of the players had the piercings, tattoos, and clothing, such as a studded belt or a thumb ring, that telegraphed lesbian or dyke to those transnationally, to those in the know. And this sort of performative fluidity, Monica explained to me, was an integral part of what she termed her lesbian swagger. 
a mode of confident self-presentation that drew on a number of styles to attract women, but also to deflect homophobic insults. Meninga was aware of how our identity functioned as a public performance, calibrated to project a certain controllable image. Even her nickname, Maniga, when spoken intentionally sounds like a hip hop inflected version of the N word, like as in, what up, Maniga? And um, it was more about style and swagger than a true essence. When, questioned, when I questioned on her about its origin, she reflected that the name had become a symbol on which she had built her image. Oh, this Maniga name made me be, to be so famous. I don't know why, she told me. This Maniga made me to have so many girlfriends. This persona, to which she attributed a life of its own, adapted global hip hop culture to carry South African resonances. She noted, for instance, that here in South Africa, when you say niga niga, and niga is also the Zulu verb to give, when, you say, when they call you niga niga, niga niga is like, I give, you give. If you give me respect, I give you respect back, you see? Several chosen few players identified culture, the ground in which black same-sex attraction have been, has been popularly rejected and demeaned, as a space for queer reclamation. According to Scaps, the team's captain, quote, culture is human made. It was made by those forefathers, the, the ancestors. So I can make my own culture. Decimating the logic that argues that African culture and its supposed opposition to homosexuality is timeless, Scaps found solace in what she saw as culture's invented nature. Indeed, one of the most effective challenges to the dictum that homosexuality is un-African arguably comes not from a rejection of, but rather an engagement with traditional African cultures as they are understood, its attendant rituals and cosmologies. So I'm gonna end today with an example of one such uh, queering of culture reframing where the African lesbian, rather than being an oddity or a reproductive dead end, actually becomes a conduit to both past and the future. April 2011 was a particularly difficult time for Johannesburg's LGBT community. Uh, an acquaintance of many of the team's me team members, Thule, had been raped and murdered, a death shortly followed by a similar murder of Notolo, a fellow activist and organizer for, the, for Kwatemba Township's Pride March. Manigya saw these deaths as inextricable from her own life, She's telling me, it killed me when I'm busy with my girlfriend, while I'm busy getting drunk, while I'm busy sleeping comfortably, Thule is busy crying and screaming for help. At the end of an hour-long interview in which she's talked without pause, Maniga reported having a number of recent violent and fantastical dreams and confessed that she, to me that she was planning to make a pilgrimage to the mountains of Lesotho to find her ancestral roots. Following as this did on a lengthy discussion of style and politics and the politics of contemporary feminism, this line of thought marked a startling shift in register. Though some might have written her off as a township, just a township lesbian, an aberration or an anomaly, she was eager to situate herself as a product of a proud heritage, saying, I am a Masutu person, a Sutu speaker. I am from Mafakeng, which is Bafoka, a royal family. She saw herself called into this lineage through the narrative of a journey out of shadow, saying, quote, I'm going forward, but I'm going back into the earth. You know, I, I need to see the light. As Miniga narrated her journey to me, she seemed to momentarily leave the context of her township life, where she sat hunched on her bed talking to me and occasionally swigging from a beer. She felt she could only progress by going back to her roots, where she could, as she saw it, bathe in the river water to take away this anger. The conflict between cultural tradition and individual freedom is a staple of Southern African oral tradition. Often the struggle is joined in the body of a single protagonist, termed by uh, folklorist Harold Schub as its cultural hero. Through her enunciation of a conflicted self, Maniga located herself at the center of this struggle. She drew on this familiar narrative framework to assert her desire to find a road that would be right for her and aid her in balancing the tensions that she felt between these multiple identities, her imagined community, and the freedom that she hoped to find, paradoxically, in tradition. Where violent enactments of tradition and oppressive ikolcha placed her at risk on a daily basis, causing her to wear her projected persona, this maniga name, like a shield, her self-narration allowed her to imagine immersing her naked, vulnerable lesbian body at the source of its creation. If the, if the lives of many South African lesbians are bisected by the contradictory lines of tradition and freedom, Maniga's imagined cultural journey became a prismatic space where at least momentarily, these tensions might be united. Thank you.
Jenny. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, it's great to be here this afternoon, and I'm very glad to see that the Institute for Women, Peace and Security is very well represented as well. Um, and I was just thinking, I mean, I'm maybe the only economist here this afternoon, so I'm glad that um, although the, the, the paper that Nassim was speaking to, I think, you know, raises very important issues that labor economists are often um, investigating. But what I'm going to talk about actually, I think, builds on quite nicely what April was talking about, because it's about um, laws and norms um, and to what extent laws make a make a difference. And so April was talking about a constitution which was very progressive, but not necessarily making a difference on the ground. What I'm going to be talking about this afternoon are laws against um, domestic violence, against marital rape, and whether or not those seem to make a difference. Um, it's going to be quite different from a number of the other papers. It's, it's very much a global study. I have a data set with 84 countries. I'll run through the slides you know, relatively quickly, um, and I'm very happy to, um, to take um, uh, questions afterwards. Um, so what I'll do is just to give a little bit of context initially, um, I'll talk a bit about what we know in terms of patterns of violence against women around the world, um, and then what we know about what drives differences at the country level, um, and then some new results that we have from some uh, recent uh, econometric analysis. Uh, this work has been joined with a, with a colleague of mine, uh, Lily Lee. Um, so the, on the definitional side, um, there's very well established internationally um, definitions of violence against women, which recognize not only kind of physical and sexual harm, but also emotional abuse, financial abuse, and so on. Uh, what I'll be talking about this afternoon relates to intimate partner violence. So that's violence inflicted by a boyfriend, a partner, um, uh, a live-in um, spouse. Um, the legal framework internationally is quite clear, um, and it's emerged over time, but it adopts this kind of broader definition. Um, there's a responsibility on states to prevent violence, um, and also um, consensus that this is a violation against human rights. So that's kind of the global context within which a lot of the reforms that are going to be talking about on the legal front have come about. Um, and just quickly a note on, um, on data and reporting. If you look at any kind of administrative data or criminal justice data on violence against women, there's a huge amount of underreporting. So the data I'm going to be using today is all based on um, kind of population and individual surveys. Um, so there still may be some underreporting due to kind of failure to disclose, um, but it's not based on you know, who was prepared to go to the police because we know that that's... Um, very much um, underestimated. So even in Europe, for example, um, only about 14% of women who have suffered um, violence in the hand of their partners actually uh, go for help, and the rates are much lower in, in many other countries. So the overall pattern here by now is quite well known. And actually in the class, uh, I teach a, a course on gender and development, and I do this kind of pop quiz, and there's a question, um, a kind of multiple choice one, uh, how many women have been affected by violence in their lifetimes? And I give like one in 10, you know, one in 20 or one in three. And everybody now knows that the figure is one in three in terms of women uh, being affected by violence in their lifetime. But you can even see from this graph, um, which presents regional averages, that there is significant variation across regions around the world. And I think even more interestingly, and it comes up here, within regions, there's significant differences. So here we have Africa, the Middle East and North Africa, Europe and Central Asia, South Asia, East Asia and the Pacific, and in Latin America. And you can, the regional averages are the bars, but then we have countries which have much, much higher rates and countries which have far below. So that's kind of interesting. It's not just the income, it's not just region and kind of the, the sorts of things that we associate with regional differences which are making a difference. Something else seems to be going on. Likewise, if we look at categories of countries uh, in terms of income, so low-income countries, middle-income, high-income, again, you get enormous variation. So there's clearly other stuff um, going on as well. So the interesting thing then is to try and work out, well, what's really making a difference? Um, this is just some initial work we've been doing correlating against a new multidimensional index that we've developed at the Institute together with Norwegian colleagues. And what our index does is have different um, measures of women's um, uh, well-being related to education, um, employment, as well as 
aspects related to justice and security, and not surprisingly, there's quite a high correlation. So that gives you a bit of a sense of women's status in society making a difference to whether or not she's likely to be subject to violence. Um, I'll just go very quickly through this part here. So these are a couple of the existing studies. So I've got a paper that I did a couple of years ago. It's published in Feminist Economics, where we looked, we used data for 22 developing countries. Um, to see what really makes a difference. So there's things which are really quite well established, like, for example, um, the experience of violence as a child is a very high predictor of violence. Our husband's characteristics, um, use of alcohol is a big predictor. Um, education made a difference, but possibly not as much as we might expect. Um, and we also found there that whether or not the country had a law against domestic violence did seem to make a difference, which was encouraging, and that's the point that I'm going to be um, looking at in more detail here. There's another uh, paper published in The Lancet a couple of years ago where it was very much motivated by these across-country differences, what's really making a difference. And what they did was... Um, explore legal discrimination, different aspects of kind of laws um, related to kind of women's equal pay, you know, maternity leave, a whole bunch of things to see whether that made a difference. And it did seem to make a broad difference in terms of uh, women's risk of violence. But of course, that may be a proxy, you know, for differences across societies in their attitudes to women's as well in terms of attitudes towards um, violence. The other thing that we can, um, that we looked at in previous studies is drawing on um, a, a data set called the Demographic and Health Surveys, there's actually a question there. They ask women, do you think it's okay to be beaten by your husband? Um, and quite shockingly, in, uh, across the developing countries in which this question is asked, there's about 50 countries, the average is about 45% of women across all income groups think it's okay to be beaten by their husband. For, they say it's like for burning the food, for getting home late, so various trivial reasons. Um, ranging as high as over 70% in Niger. So seven in 10 women in Niger think it's okay to be beaten um, by their husband. The good news, however, is, um, well, some good news, is that if you look at these surveys over time, across a number of countries, you do tend to see some improvements in the sense that fewer women are tending to agree with this question that it's okay. Uh, to be subject to violence. And so the question is, well, what difference then in this context can laws make? And what we see, and this is from 1976 through to 2015, and this is just the cumulative number of countries which have a law in place against violence. So back in the mid-70s, no countries prohibited marital rape. Um, and so there's been really a sea change in the context of the international legal framework and the evolution there. At the country level, national parliaments you know, proclaiming that it's unacceptable um, to, um, uh, to commit violence against one's spouse. The nature of the laws differ in terms of, like, the scope and the um, uh, sanctions, as well as, of course, the degree to which they're enforced. But you can see there's been a huge difference over time. So the question is, what difference does this make? So we took a new look at this evidence um, using data on intimate partner violence that's available online from UN Women and then various other sources of data, both about norms um, and proxies for norms about how people think about women's status in society, uh, about institutions, as well as about government effectiveness, which might um, suggest about what's happening in terms of um, uh, whether or not the law's likely to be enforced. So let me just skip through to the results. I mean, broadly speaking, the overall relations are an expected uh, directions, which is normally what economists do, right? We look at something and you think, yeah, of course, you know, that, that should have been the case. Um, so we find that gender norms matter, um, and in particular, the, the measure of norms that we had was whether or not you think it's okay for women to work. Um, and where large numbers of people disagree with that proposition, again, you know, for example, 75% of Pakistani men think it's not acceptable for women to work. Um, it's, it's more likely that rates of violence are going to be uh, higher. Uh, laws in general make a difference. So we looked at laws around women's land ownership, about the family code, whether they're able to divorce and so on. Those make a difference, again, unsurprisingly. Um, and then we look more specifically at the, um, uh, the role that laws actually uh, play. Um, and so basically here we find that laws do make a difference. So that's good news because a lot more countries are introducing these laws and they do seem to make a difference. Uh, but the other laws also make a difference. So these other laws around property ownership, around um, family law, unsurprisingly, 
also matter. Um, and we included our new um, WPS index in these um, analysis as well, which kind of measure women's status in society, and that also makes a difference. So these are things which are being measured in a regression, and they're still showing up as being significant. So in themselves, um, uh, seem, to, seem to matter. Um, so I guess just this is the final slide here. Um, laws can be significant. They seem to be a vehicle to change norms and to lead to the reductions in the risk of violence over time, but yet clearly not enough. We need kind of supportive legal environment more broadly and a multi-pronged approach um, which address other sources of discrimination as well. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I thought going into this that that there might be less dialogue between the papers, and now I'm thinking, wait a minute, you started with relative value, which in, in and of itself is kind of an amazing way of ranking by gender, right, or by ranking productivity. Relative value, in a way, you're talking about relative cultural visibility, and, and you're talking about relative violence and vulnerability, and, and, and there are different forms of value and performance of value. And um, I, it, it, I, it did end up that there's real um, dialogue, I think, going on here. I'd love to open up the floor to questions for any of the panelists. Jane. Hi, I'm Jane Varner Malhotra. I'm the editor of Georgetown Medicine Magazine. I work over in advancement. And I just wanted to um, comment, actually the whole afternoon has been terrific for me. I've seen a lot of familiar faces and these issues resonate in medicine so deeply, um, both in the practice and research and um, in the care that we receive. But I, I wanted to um, point out to Nassim and others, if you're interested, our latest issue just came out and it's on women in medicine and I've put copies of it on the table there. It's online now. And one of the articles talks a lot about um, uh, you know, um, paid disparities. It's all about the Georgetown Women in Medicine um, organization that Christy Graves is leading right now. But um, I wonder, um, you know, in something like that, what is, where is Georgetown in this um, conversation, for example? and neurology? Yeah. It's a really good question. I think that one of the difficulties that we have in academic medicine is that there isn't a lot of transparency. So we oftentimes think um, you know, that in private practice, in private practices actually, everyone kind of knows. Everyone kind of knows how productive another person is and how much revenue they generated and what their compensation is. Part of the difficulty in our environment is that there is no transparency. And so that makes it very hard to hold chairs, department chairs accountable um, because if we are not empowered by data, if we don't have this information to advocate for ourselves, um, it makes it very, very challenging. And so it, the onus is on the person, the physician, to uh, go find the data whether whatever data you can get your hands on, whether it's at your own institution, national data, and to sit down with uh, your department chair and say, hey, uh, this, is, uh, this is where I am, this is what the national trend is, and this is where I want to be. And what I find is that a lot of, um, particularly junior faculty, don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, I think that it's pretty, um, widely acknowledge that men tend to negotiate better for themselves both at the time of hire and also just throughout their career. And so I think Gwim has done a great job of providing opportunities to sort of learn some of those skills so that we can better um, advocate for ourselves. Certainly I'm trying to do that and sort of mentoring my residents and students to do that as well because it's not something that we're really taught in medicine. And in most fields, I'm not sure that it's something that we're really taught. I, I don't know that everyone knows what WIM is. Would you, could you explain that? Um, Georgetown Women in Medicine, it's a, a group that uh, is open to, I think, you know, any um, woman physician in the sciences. Faculty. Faculty. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> 
some of the structural elements that were mentioned happen and maybe across all of the campuses, I'm not sure, but um, for example, physicians employed by MedStar, and I'm a Georgetown employed person, so I can say this, they aren't allowed to talk about their salary and there's legal repercussions for some of those things. And so I think there's structural barriers that prevent equity. And you know, we heard a few examples now in, in earlier panels. And so there's a lot of work to be done to raise awareness about those things. And happy in the reception to talk to anyone about Georgetown Women in Medicine. And there's a um, article in the uh, magazine that Jane mentioned. While the microphone's going over, I want to thank Jane specifically. The Georgetown Medicine Journal um, magazine that's out there also has a lovely little um, squib about the gender justice initiative mm -hmm. in addition to being dedicated to women in medicine. So thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Krim. And I actually was wondering whether there's any research out there that looks at law firms with the billable hour. I was thinking there might really be some parallels in what you see happening there and how, for example, maternity leaves are accounted for in figuring out the productivity of lawyers. Anyway, it just seems like it could be another source of a model. I don't know that they've solved for it because I, you know, I think the life of women in law firms is pretty rough, but it's just another similar model, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think you're so right. I mean, I think um, we're sort of just now this data is being generated. So it's, uh, it's kind of all unfolding and we're realizing the extent of the problem, which I think is a, is a great first step because if we can recognize hey, there's a problem. There's a problem within our own institution. There is a problem within our very own hospital. Um, and then we can start to have those discussions as to how to um, address those issues, which are not easy questions. I think there has been some um, data generated about law firms, but again, it's very hard to get. And, um, and I do think that one of the things that you see is the to go back to Nan's phrase from this morning, the embeddedness of inequality, and it goes to something, Nassim, that you were talking about, which is the um, women taking parental leave and men not taking parental leave, and then the compounding of those choices over time, and the what has become known in law firms as the mommy track um, of part-time employment and labor contracting that then looks different through time. And I also think it's really important to, to think, know that this is not just you know, in medicine. I mean, I think it's an academic problem. I'm sure many of you uh, have experienced around kind of this opacity of, of salaries. So it's hard to, and, and then the different levels of you know, adjunct labor versus um, non-tenure track versus tenure track. So I think this is, there's obviously a lot, I think this is an institutional problem across the board, across all our institutions. There so, is some, um, Claudia Golden from Harvard, uh, who was president of the American Economic Association in her presidential address a couple of years ago, um, had a title, something called The Grand Convergence. She's been working on wage gaps for 30 years. Um, and it was interesting. She actually didn't look at medicine, but she, in particular, was um, law and finance, which seemed to still have the largest relative pay gaps. And what she identified was a premium, and I suspect it might be the same for medicine, where there's a very non-linear return to having extraordinarily high hours. And so if you do more than, say, 45 or 50 hours a week, um, your pay goes up exponentially in, in both finance mm -hmm. and law. And it may be the same in medicine. So it's the men who, um, you know, because they're not sharing responsibilities at home, um, are able to work the 50-hour the week or the 55-hour week. And in compensation for that, you know, they're getting enormously higher earnings just for mm -hmm. that, you know, if you like, bit extra. So there might be some analogies there mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so it wouldn't be their kind of overall productivity. It's just the preparedness to, you know, the be there, I guess. Yeah. I wanted to jump in and bring culture in. Um, it's really disturbing to hear. I mean, if you do the math, if 
if a woman has two kids, so she's out of earning revenue as a productive unit for six months, it just doesn't hold water, right? So what, and, and you know, I'm like a lot of you, I'm angry this week, like I'm angry. And I think what, what you know, is becoming more and more in the ether, but we all know, is that those who have power don't wanna give it up. Mm -hmm. And I worked at, a small feminist think tank when I was just a couple of years older than, than you young women who are still at Georgetown. And I worked with Felice Schwartz, a catalyst, and she wrote that article called The Mommy Track in the Harvard Business Review. And it was deliberately misconstrued by a woman reporter in the front page of the New York Times. As Felice arguing, it was, she was developing the idea of a flexible workplace. We didn't have computers, you couldn't really work at home, you kind of had to show up. But it was this incredibly bold idea of we need to value all kinds of thought in the workplace, right? We need to have more people of color, queer people, women. This was crazy back then, right? And it got that whole um, idea about making it more possible for people to grow their career right, and be there for the long haul, and my gosh, what people contribute over the long haul. You heard the wisdom with Professor Hunter today, right? Um, but it got construed as Felice arguing that there should be two tracks. There should be those of us who, who decide to have children or take care of elders or, right, or take care of somebody who's ill. Um, and then the, you know, the real deals. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just wanna make sure in particular that the younger folks in the room like just push back on this bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't fit in a, in a, just in a chart. These are cultural choices we make. And I'll say one thing, when I came to Georgetown, there was no parental leave policy for having, when you went on, um, when you had a baby. So I had to help write it. But it meant that I didn't, I had to, you know, cut backroom deals. That just doesn't just happen. That's what you place value on. And it happens in, in a culture that we're trying to rewrite. Thank you all for a wonderful panel. So my question is uh, coming from uh, kind of a basic science point of view, what we do is we do a lot of interventions. And so I'm wondering, uh, I mean, can you think of, uh, I mean, so you have this, I mean, you're, you're looking at, uh, Jenny, you're looking at all these different countries and you're using, you're looking at associations and uh, Nassim, you're also, you're looking at associations, but what about, what about organizations that actually uh, try something and then get positive results in, lo in minimizing mm -hmm. that gap? I mean, is there any data that would suggest if you uh, uh, figure out salaries based on another mechanism, then uh, I'm not sure what RVUs are in terms of, uh, you know, how are they, you know, are you just basing salary on RVU? I don't think so. I mean, is there, are there some uh, models out there that actually show promise? And, and also for you know, violence against women. Sure. Um, well, I think that, um, I think part of the difficulty is that there's no uniform way in which we are all employed, right? Everybody has a different contract. There are different variables that go into it and they are negotiated in different ways. And so I think that one of the things that I've done with this data, I've been working with the Academy, is we developed a task force to try to figure out what can we do to give this information to trainees, to junior faculty, to even senior faculty, so that they are aware that, because a lot of people aren't aware, you know, a lot of people aren't aware that they're being uh, compensated, you know, significantly less than their male counterparts. They just don't know. And so, at, you know, at the national level, what we're trying to do is uh, bring awareness to the, this problem. Um, and then sort of give, um, give women the tools to go to that person above them and say, hey, this, there's a problem here, and how can we work together to address it? How can I get to where I need to be? And it has to be done on an individual level. I don't know that, um, 
you know, I think on a national level, I think we just need to bring awareness to this issue and um, allow women to have the negotiating tools as GWIM does um, to address these disparities so that we can advocate for ourselves because quite frankly, nobody else is going to do it for us. So can I, can I just respond to that? Because I'm on the, and, sure. and Jenny, I would love to hear what you have to say about intervention. Like what, at what, where do we make those interventions? And as someone who works on law and culture, I think those are two really important places and sites of intervention. And, and in particular, it's very clear that some laws in some contexts clearly make a difference. I love your work, Jenny, because mm -hmm. of the way that it shows that. But one example is non-transferable non parental leave in mm -hmm. places mm -hmm. like Sweden, right? Mm -hmm that changes the dynamic of caretaking a, like down the road. Mm -hmm. And I mean, talk about remaking the future. Mm -hmm. it, it then changes people's mm -hmm. relationship both to domestic work and paid labor um, along the way. And then there's also cultural intervention and cultural intervention thinking about the ways in which our own attitudes are help to create in a, or sustain inequality. So if you ask American women how, what percentage of people think that mothers do a better job of parenting, right? I bet you get, I don't know, I haven't actually seen this research, but there is a belief that mothers actually are better parents than fathers and that helps reproduce the inequalities of domestic labor, even just down to packing lunches, right? And that the inequality in domestic labor then has repercussions in paid labor as well. So I just think those, and, and of course there's academic interventions, which is what we're doing right here. <laughs> All right, Jenny. Um, no, so one thing I was actually gonna mention, last year I um, co-authored the high level panel on women's economic empowerment for the UN Secretary General with Laura Tyson. And uh, these things came out quite strongly. So pay transparency is a big one. Um, and um, parental leave arrangements, so-called use it or lose it, can be very important. Um, occupational segregation is very important. So we saw that like even within the um, neurology, which I just thought was one occupation, but clearly it's not, you know, there's a lot. <laughs> so we saw the pay differences within that. So women kind of sort, sorting, what economists call sorting, but then, you know, they're going into particular parts of that, which tend to be less well remunerated. And we see that kind of writ large in the, in the society and the economy. Collective voice can be very important as well. So there's some things that we know can make a difference. And there's actual tools, there's something called EDGE, which is quite interesting, which is a, um, which is something which some major organizations do now to kind of benchmark themselves in terms of equality in the workplace um, and whether or not there are unexplained differences in pay. So if they're unexplained if they're not accounted for by education experience and, the, and these other things. And then the firms have to actually show. So in some places in, um, in uh, Switzerland, for example, uh, in firms which have government contracts have to have an unexplained pay gap of less than 5%, otherwise they can't get contracts. I think Albuquerque has actually done the same thing. So there's kind of innovations like that where you're really kind of pushing uh, for change. On the, um, on the violence side, there is a lot of encouraging um, innovation over the past several years, so quite careful um, kind of randomized trials or kind of other types of um, experimental data which show how community level interventions can make a difference. Engaging men and boys makes an enormous difference. Um, there's a very encouraging program in Uganda called SASA, uh, which was over several years, which was very much about empowering women in the community, but um, jointly with, with men and boys. Uh, safe spaces uh, for girls um, and um, kind of making them aware of their rights, that they can say no to sex. Um, and some of those have been done in conjunction with economic programs. So you're kind of training girls in kind of livelihoods, but then you're also providing sexual and reproductive health kind of rights and knowledge kind of training and various other things that can make a difference. Um, and then there's broader programs. South Africa has an uh, interesting program called Soul City, which yeah. has been running for a few years, which was very much kind of <coughs> along those sorts of lines and was apparently quite influential. And then I guess the other part of it that I think people working in development have become more conscious of, of over time is that change um, 
can also create risks for women. So if women um, uh, become kind of primary bread earners or they're receiving the cash transfer, they can become subject, the, the risk of violence can actually increase over time. So to develop programs which are cognizant of those risks. Um, so, you know, sure they've got a job, but when they get home they get beaten up. You mm. know, it... it um, that's been a difficult. huge issue mm -hmm. with South Africa because a lot of there have been really great programs by the government to empower women mm -hmm. um, and to get equal representation, uh, but it also has an incredibly high unemployment rate, and so a lot of and this embrace neoliberal economics, and so a lot of people men are out of jobs and they feel like women get the jobs now, and so especially with with uh, vis you know visible lesbians, uh, often they are seen as stealing men's prerogatives, uh, even in their gender performances and stealing their girlfriends and doing all these things. And so that's kind of a general, and, and South Africa has one of the highest rates of sexual violence more generally in the world. Um, and I think that it is all interlinked with this kind of resentment that many men feel towards what they perceive as women's be, women being able to access, even though most women are not able to access that because of the class and race divisions. So it does backfire. I have, did you want to? Okay. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a 1L at Georgetown. Um, and I had a question actually very much related to what you were just speaking about um, in terms of um, interventions, I suppose, and access. So my question is about um, the rate of reporting of gender-based violence and intimate partner violence. Um, because I, I know that it differs greatly between countries, and this is what you were speaking about, kind of, I, I'm wondering if, um, because I've been hearing, like, I mean, I think we all know that there's an increased push for, like, speaking about personal experiences with gender-based violence and um, a push in the medical field for, like, in an emergency intake for an assault, you also ask about a sexual mm -hmm. assault. So kind of trying to incorporate discussions about gender-based violence in conversations. And I wanted to know if, if there's any if you've seen or if there's been work done on like the differences between countries or areas of the world where the increased rate of reporting is actually helping decrease the rate of violence because then it's a part of the conversation as a whole, including men and boys, old, young, the whole thing, mm -hmm. if, if talking about it more actually helps. Um, well, no, I'm sure that kind of disclosure and um, awareness are very important. Um, and it's uh, and even within individual countries, you sometimes get numbers which are kind of highly variable. Um, so you definitely don't want to use administrative data or kind of crime data or even medical data because you know there's much less likely to be disclosed. Um, WHO has quite careful protocols for the way in which they ask the questions and so on, which are now being followed in the surveys. So there should be some consistency, but you know clearly there are going to be differences in the preparedness of people to report. And just one. Uh, example I wanted to mention is something called the Nordic paradox. So in Norway, which has the you know the parental leave and you know the the smallest pay gaps in the world, and so on, actually have very high rates of intimate reported rates of intimate partner violence. Um, and it's a bit of a puzzle, and it could be because of the disruption of gender roles. Um, and you know, possibly alcohol and, and other things which are going on, or it could be that you know women are really feeling more able and more empowered to report. Um, and there's some recent academic literature on this. I don't think it's been fully untangled, but um, I guess in my graphs, um, Israel was the highest um, among the kind of rich countries, but the, the Nordic countries are actually pretty high. You know, they're kind of close to 30%, uh, which is much, you know, compared to how they perform on other aspects of gender equality, um, is an outlier. So I think it, it can be an issue. I haven't seen, though, data over time which shows, um, you know, greater awareness leading to kind of falls in, in rates of um, progress over time. Because a lot of this is, is really quite recent as well. Um, so we don't really, so for example, on the interventions, um, there's a couple of uh, systematic um, reviews now, but um, there's a real paucity of studies, um, certainly in developing countries. Last question. Uh, I'll be really quick because I know there's nope, cocktails. Sure good. Uh, <laughs> um, I think uh, you know we started off the afternoon talking about intersectionality, and I think that that's echoing now. When I this caution about taking for granted the idea that maternal leave is like damaging productivity, and that's you know that's the issue. Because I think 
this is a great example of where if you look into the racial breakdown of pay disparity, then what's the answer going to be then? Because it's not going to be that black women take longer maternity leave, right? Or the black mm. men, you know, what, what kind of leave are they taking that justifies this? So I think an intersectional lens is the kind of area where that's, that's really uh, useful. And then also the kind of international comparative approach. If you look at uh, country contexts where paternity leave is optional, I think it'd be interesting to see, or it'd be worthwhile looking at whether the take up impacts people's long-term earnings. My suspicion, which could be, you know, it's entirely speculative, it could be wrong, my suspicion would be that people who are taking up paternity leave are not getting the same accusation, or well, your productivity dropped then for three to six months, hmm. uh, compared to others who, who do. So I think maybe looking at those, out, it, when, when the, the temptation is to say, oh, it's, you know, it's this, then to look, at the, look for the answers that maybe um, prove that it's not, because I think it's a little bit, uh, a little bit too convenient <laughs> that maternity leave is, is, is what's uh, causing the pay gap. In my Absolutely. Opinion. Yes. I think there, there are so many factors, um, and that's the difficult part in teasing it out. Um, there's just no uh, way to clearly associate um, X with Y, and, it, and that really makes it difficult to address the problem. You know, we can speculate. Um, one of my goals is just to continue to gather data. I think that the more data that we can gather to sort of describe this problem and understand this problem, then I think the better we can do um, to change it, to address it. So thank you again, all three of you. And um, I, I do want to take just two minutes between um, food and warmth, which is outside those doors. Um, is I want to just say that over the last couple of years, Denise Brennan, Christy Graves, Lisa Krim, Catherine Sandberg, Nan Hunter, and I have been living in the as if, and I really appreciate your title. <laughs> the, we live in the age of the subjunctive, and, um, and living as if there were such thing as a gender justice initiative at Georgetown. And it's so thrilling that now we have an opportunity to really build it. And I just want to invite you and, in fact, beg you to help us do that and help it become a place that um, it couldn't not be institutionalized at the end of that period. So um, that's, the, that's the invitation and the plea. And then last but absolutely not least is um, Laura Chippero, who has been doing all of the administrative, most of the administrative work to get us here, a lot of the planning and um, making our website and working with the caterer. Thank you so much, Laura. Really appreciate it.